Hello, my name is Glenn Schulz with the FDT Group. Today I'd like to introduce you to the FDT Industrial Internet of Things Server, or FITS for short. Here you see the FDT architecture as it exists in standalone like desktop type applications. There's two primary components. One is the DTM. This represents the physical devices in the industrial automation network. And the second component is the frame application that hosts these DTMs. Typically the frame application also serves as a higher level application for things such as asset management, maintenance management systems, configuration systems, and so on. This architecture is widely deployed around the world. There's hundreds of thousands of frames installed and tens of millions of DTMs have been shipped to support these types of applications. If you take the frame and essentially divide it in half through the middle of the frame application, you then get the architecture for our client server version. Here, part of that frame application is installed on the client computer, and the other part is stall, installed on the server computer. You notice the DTM is normally divided into two parts. The bottom part is the business logic for the DTM, and the upper part is the user interface for the DTM. So in this configuration, the user interface is installed on the client computers, and the business logic resides on the server computers. Any number of clients can then connect to this server computer, so you get a multi-user application with FDT. We do not specify from a standards perspective how the two parts of the frame application should communicate with one another. We leave this to best practices by the vendor community, but this also typically implies that you must use frame client applications and server applications from the same vendor. If we take that frame business logic and the DTM business logic, this becomes the core of our FITS architecture. It largely protects the investment that's been made in our standard over the years. So things like the business logic, all the well-defined interfaces, and our tool set for developers that's called common components all remain essentially intact. This architecture also allows it to be deployed in an operating system agnostic implementation. So you'll see that where we can use Android, iOS, and other types of clients with this architecture. And with the changing landscape of architectures, it's also notable that this allows this uh, fit server to be deployed in a cloud type application, or you can bring it nearer to the edge of the enterprise in FOG applications. It, of course, could be installed as a local server within a facility, and it could also be run in a standalone application on a desktop, for instance. We surround this core with three primary components. On the left side, we have OPC UA. Immediately to the right, we have web services. And in the lower blue part is the control part of the application. So the web services supports things like browsers, apps, standalone applications, and anything that's capable of interfacing using web sockets. The OPC UA part of it allows broad enterprise uh, integration. Information can be shared between higher level applications and any of the information that's available through the FITS architecture. On the control side, this is how we control to the industrial automation networks and the devices that are attached to that. And again, this connectivity remains intact no matter how this server is deployed. So whether it's directly connected to the industrial internet, whether it's connected in the fog, whether it's up in the cloud, or whether it's a standalone application, the connectivity remains intact. We retain all the features that FDT is well known for, for nesting or tunneling through all the different networks, and it'll continue to support the more than 16 control networks and growing that it supports today. 
If we look at the web services side of FITS, uh, we see this is how we get the direct support for things like browsers, so the ultimate thin client. So this means you could take Internet Explorer, Firefox, and other browsers and use them to gain access to the DTM and frame parts of the application. But you could also use it to write custom apps, and I'll give you an example of that shortly. Uh, you could have programs written that take advantage of the web services, or other applications that are just web service aware would also gain connectivity through this mechanism. All of these devices that are connecting through web services could be connected through wire, like Ethernet type applications, uh, or fiber Ethernet as well, but probably more often it'll be a Wi-Fi, 4G, LTE, or some other type of wireless network for this connectivity. Because uh, the concerns are growing in the industry about security, this model does have a very robust layered security model. We'll take a look at that in just a minute. But it does leverage well-vetted industry standards to achieve that security. Here's just a sample application of how a maintenance app potentially could work in this architecture. So you notice we are uh, I've got a screen where it's asking for an asset tag number and then once that's entered you can select a number of actions such as actually launch the full DTM for that device. Maybe you just want to check on the current process values, the health of that asset, or maybe the maintenance person is just looking to get a copy of the manual. The interesting thing in this application, while you could type in the asset tag number, it could also be that that asset tag is barcoded. And so with the camera and the phone, you simply snap a picture of the barcode, it populates the asset tag number, and then executes what you're looking for. It could also be done with near field communications, so it could be wireless tags as well, and you simply need to get the phone near the wireless tags, populate the asset tag number through that method, and then move on with the actions required. This is a great example of how an app could be designed for uh, maintenance people to help them basically work smarter and maximize the availability of the equipment by minimizing the time they spend in repair activities. Here we have a look at how the security on FITS works. So on the outer part of the security, the hard outer shell, it's comprised of HTTPS and WSS. Most people are familiar with HTTPS when you're doing secure web transactions. You're always looking to make sure that that's present and it's encrypted communications. Underlying that protocol is a thing called TLS, and TLS is also used for secure web sockets, or WSS. So TLS will be used throughout the architecture to put a very hardened shell and encrypt all the communications that occurs with FITS. Immediately below that level, we have the option that we can authorize devices that are connecting to FITS as well. So here you can think about a tablet and the IT community or the controls community can decide, is this tablet itself even allowed to access the server? Uh, coming into our industry is on the wire security. Uh, that will be, uh, the, the on the wire security will be covered as well by our standard. And then of course we have the existing user-based security. So you need as a user to log in and based on your login credentials, that determines your role and the rights that you get within the application. You notice in the middle of this, the technology that's being deployed is HTML5 and JavaScript for all the visualization. And we have WebSockets and REST as some of the underlying technology as well. On the control system connectivity part of the equation, we have to be able to anticipate a wide variety of architectures, but in doing so, we want to make sure that the tunneling and nesting works in all scenarios, and that is the case. So we can still accommodate traditional direct connections where the industrial automation network is directly connected to the server, but we can also accommodate secure remote connections. So in the case of a more extreme remote connection, such as a cloud architecture, where as you see in the diagram here, it has to connect to a number of control networks, it can do that in a variety of ways. A class of devices that's starting to take form in the IIoT world is a thing called an edge device. 
And broadly stated, we can say that that edge device converts an industrial control network protocol to something that's more suitable for use in an IIoT internet scenario. And here we've got one that's converting an industrial control network to a fairly well-known standard called MQTT. Um, and in another case, you might have simply a connection through a firewall. So you might have, for example, a Cisco firewall where you've got a VPN connection going up to the fits in the cloud. From the FDT perspective, the interesting thing is the only thing that has to happen to enable any of these types of protocols is another gateway DTM that just gets installed in FITS. So nothing new there in terms of the architecture, but highly extensible to support all the capabilities of cloud-based applications. Another interesting thing about this architecture is typically you'll see today FDT deployed in a single instance for a single facility. But with cloud-based applications and fog-based applications, it's very likely that a single installation would support an entire enterprise from the cloud. Um, this will work with all scenarios and all features are maintained with that type of architecture. Uh, all the communications, of course, are highly secured, as was described in the earlier security slide. And uh, we can accommodate any number of industrial networks and any number of plants with this architecture. Then for broader enterprise connectivity, we have OPC UA natively on the server. This could connect things like PLCs or MES applications or ERP applications, regardless of whether they're themselves in the cloud or they're somewhere in within the enterprise, they can achieve connectivity through the very well accepted OPC UA standard. We do support the publish subscribe methodology of OPC and the types of things you could exchange here are real type plant information. Uh, you could inquire asset health or availability or you could also browse or catalog the plant topology, either a logical or physical view of that plant topology. And while often this is considered a way of getting information out of FITS into MES or other applications, you can also write data into FITS through this connectivity as well. So here you have a view of the connected enterprise basically using all of these components to get a broader scope. So on the upper right you see that we have a web browser accessing the FITS application and we could then view DTMs and other activities through that. Just below that is a phone that's perhaps running some custom app that's developed for Android or iOS and downloadable from their web stores. Uh, a variety of tablets, phones, anything that really supports a browser or an app can be used in these applications. Then we also have secure connection shown to a couple of facilities, one using MQTT, uh, one using VPN. And of course, then you could also connect to the corporate ERP application through the cloud and secure connections using OPC UA. So just one example of the very broad architectural possibilities of FITS. From a schedule perspective, uh, we're working aggressively on completing the architecture. We'll begin member workshops on this new architecture in September of this year. Uh, so that members can start to get uh, their technical staffs geared up to support this architecture. Uh, the specification itself will come out uh, publicly in July of 2018. Uh, we are currently prototyping the balance of the architecture. Uh, we will have the specification completely drafted early in 2018 and then our membership will review that specification for its normal policies. And we expect then release the specification as well as the common components, which are the developers kits, in about the July of 2018 timeline. We've got a few other things that we're still working on scheduling issues for. We know we will update our style guide uh, for this uh, enhanced standard, as well as enhancing our test and certification procedures to give coverage to these new capabilities in the architecture. Thanks very much for the time and I'd entertain any questions.